Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the kind in, um, introduction. And uh, I would express thanks to organizing committee for inviting me to this seminar. My name is Ignacy Jakubowicz. <laughs> I am an associate professor in polymer technology, and I am a scientist at the RISE Research Institutes of Sweden. And uh, I will talk about formation of microplastics by degradation and the fate of uh, in marine environment. And uh, degradation of environmental degradation of plastics is a, a very large field, and it is quite a challenge to try to uh, talk about this uh, in such a short period of time. But uh, I will try to do my best. The first, the first difficulty is the definition of microplastics, because uh, uh, you see, um, we are talking about polymer-based materials. And uh, if you look uh, at this picture, you can see that polymers can be used to make different kinds of materials. And we have fibers, rubbers, coatings, adhesives. Uh, but the most used definition is that microplastics are any synthetic solid particle of, uh, based on polymers which is insoluble in water. It means that this definition includes all those polymeric materials. But there are large differences between those materials. And even if you use the same polymer, uh, uh, we, will we can use the same polymer to create different materials, like uh, fibers or, or coatings, uh, but we can also use it for plastics, because what we call plastics is this group where that is composed of thermoplastics, which means materials that can be remelted and reshaped, and, thermos and this is the largest group, and this is a small group of thermosets, which means materials that are cross-linked, that are not possible to remelt and to reshape. But, uh, as I told you, uh, the same polymer can be used to, to make thermoplastic or fiber or adhesive, but uh, because of the manufacturing process and the uh, use of additives uh, and others, we will get different materials. So, uh, it is important to, to realize that uh, due to inherent diversity of polymeric materials, it is not possible to talk generally about the rate of degradation of, of plastics, according to this definition. And in my opinion, it is not possible to talk about toxicity either. Because uh, we are surrounded by microparticles in the environment, and most of the particles are of natural origin. So if you want to show that the microplastics uh, cr create a bigger risk to the environment, then we have to consider the chemical properties. But of course, because of different polymers and different additives, the chemical properties will differ very much between different kinds of materials. Uh, very often, uh, and we heard it before, uh, Microplastics are categorized into one singular contaminant group uh, and treated like this. Uh, so uh, it will not give us the 
instrument to, to uh, take care of the problems because we don't know which microplastics will create a risk and which will not give a risk in the environment. If we are looking into how different materials degrade, they degrade by different degradation pathways. Here you can see the most common group of polymers and you can see where the sites where the degradation normally begins are located. And if we compare, for instance, polyolefins, they degrade by abstraction of hydrogen and free radical reaction. And in PVC, it is abstraction of chlorine atom and creation of double bonds, so there are huge differences in between. And uh, if we are talking generally about the weathering of plastics, then one important thing is the existence of so-called chromophores in the polymer structure. And chromophores are groups that can interact with sunlight. Uh, and uh, starting the degradation. But there are also polymers that do not contain chromophores, but can still be degraded by uh, photo-induced uh, 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 degradation mechanism because of the existence of low concentration of impurities like uh, polymerization, residues, and, uh, and others. Uh, of course, um, also the existence of additives in the material will influence the resistance of plastics uh, towards uh, weathering or, or UV degradation. And uh, in some products that are designed to last long in the outdoor environment, we, we add some additives like stabilizers, absorbers, and blockers to protect uh, materials against degradation. Uh, and it is uh, similar when we protect our own polymers against sun uh, by using sunscreens that contain, for instance, titanium dioxide, which is also what we use to protect plastics. And if you find black materials in the environment, they probably contain some carbon black, which is also a type of absorber or a blocker. And it will, of course, influence the, the lifetime of these materials outdoors. And, of course, environmental conditions, because the temperature uh, will play a significant role, for instance. Uh, so, if we talk about degradation of polymer-based materials, I would say we can divide the degradation processes or materials that are sensitive for degradation into two groups. One group, uh, materials which will degrade mainly by hydrolysis, like uh, polyesters uh, and also cellulose, starch, polyamides uh, and others. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, uh, depend on the water or if we have some acidic or basic environment and also promotes by some enzymes in, in nature. The other group is materials that degrade by oxidation. And in this group, uh, most of the common polymers. Once the material start to degrade, we will get an abiotic chain scission. It means that the molecular weight of the polymer will decrease. 
and uh, once uh, the molecular weight has decreased below a certain size, the microorganism will be able to mineralize those uh, fragments and use them as a carbon uh, source. So the end will be carbon dioxide in the aerobic environment and methane in anaerobic and biogas uh, and biomass. And those processes uh, depend on, on the one hand, on material, including what type of polymer, additives, even design of the product. Of course, uh, very thin products will degrade much faster than very thick products, especially if we are talking about uh, photodegradation, because photodegradation uh, is mainly uh, uh, concentrated into the surface, which is then going more into the deep. And of course, manufacturing process. Uh, on the other hand, we have the environmental conditions. Uh, so temperature is always a, a very important factor. Higher temperature means higher rate of degradation. And also UV light, some chemicals, and also some physical processes like uh, migration or extraction of additives. And uh, if we are talking about degradation processes, then uh, it is uh, important to, to realize that uh, the rate of uh, degradation processes can be uh, calculated once we know the activation energy. And uh, you know that if we have this type of of reaction, any chemical reaction, uh, then uh, um, they, it is characterized by a rate constant, and this rate constant, dependent, temperature dependence of this rate constant is given by this Arrhenius equation. And you see that uh, it depends on activation energy and temperature. So from this expression, we, we can uh, calculate, for instance, an acceleration factor. We can basically use this equation to calculate, if we know the activation energy, uh, how long time it will take uh, at a certain temperature if we know the time at another temperature. And uh, for many years ago, I uh, was... Uh, curious about uh, what is the activation energy for different uh, degradation processes and for different materials. So I, I collected a lot of uh, data from the scientific literature about activation energy and plastics and rubbers. And then I plotted it in this diagram and uh, we have number of uh, materials or items uh, on this axis and activation energy. And you see most of the materials at the activation energy of about 100 kilojoule per mole, but you see the range of activation energy. And this um, value is very important because I will illustrate what it means uh, this is um, done on a, a theoretical case. If we have three materials that will degrade within one week at 70 degrees centigrade, and one of these materials has the activation energy of 70 kilojoule per mole, then uh, it will take about four and a half weeks to degrade at 50 degrees 
and about 1.3 years to degrade at 20 degrees. But if we have a material with activation energy 130 kilojoule per mole, and it will take one week at 70 degrees, then it will take uh, 17 weeks at 50 degrees and 47 years at the room temperature, or at 20 degrees centigrade. So you see, this is a very important value, uh, and it has also some other uh, practical implication. If you find a micro particle and you analyze it by infrared spectroscopy and you calculate the carbonyl index, you can say, okay, this material has been oxidized but you can still cannot know how long this material has been in the environment, because you don't know the activation energy and you don't know the environmental conditions normally. And this is uh, why uh, we have to calculate the activation energy for every single material because it were even if the materials are based on the same polymer. Okay, uh, this is so far quite general uh, reflection about degradation of polymers. But then, if, if I want to be more specific, then I have to concentrate on, on one type of materials. And then, because you see uh, the plastic demand by, well, sorry, no. Oh. If we look into this diagram, you can see that uh, about forty percent of materials, uh, polymers, are going to packaging. But if we We'll have uh, the numbers uh, regarding plastic waste. This number will be about 60%. So that's why it is so important to focus on packaging. Another reason is that plastics in, for instance, building application, they are long-lasting uh, materials and they are built in in buildings, so it is not so common that they will end up in the environment. And the same applies to automotive and electrical. So I will talk most about materials used for packaging, and among them polyolefins are the dominating groups. So this will be my focus now. And uh, I can show you that polyethylene can be used for many different applications. Uh, you can see that polyethylene can be used uh, for coating steel pipes or as shopping bags, different qualities. We can make fibers, we can make waxes, we can make crosslink polyethylene, which will be a thermoset, and we can even create paintings. Uh, but we can also use polyethylene as a thermoplastic, but for different application. And here we have a plastic bag, polyethylene bag, which is made oxobiodegradable, so it will degrade within two years. We can make food containers, which are designed for quite a short lifetime, a few months or a year or something. But we can make a car fuel tank, which is designed for at least 10 years or wastewater pipes that are designed for 50 to 100 years of lifetime. And th they are designed because we want them to last long, so we add some 
stabilizers and additives that will protect the material against degradation. So a few words about how the degradation works in polyethylene or polyolefin. Uh, so if we have no stabilizer or no protection against degradation, then we have always some catalyst residues and some uh, uh, damage introduced by processing of the material. So uh, there, is or, well, there are always some uh, alkyl radicals that can react with oxygen from the air. And this reaction is extremely fast, creating this peroxy radical. And this peroxy radical is also very reactive and will attack another polymer chain or another part of the polymer chain, abstracting the hydrogen and creating a new alkyl radical and hydroperoxide. What happens is that, of course, this alkyl radical will react with oxygen and this will will start to run faster and faster. But also, this hydroperoxide is not very stable uh, and uh, will degrade into two new radicals, and alkoxy radicals and hydroxy radicals. And both of them will attack polymer chain, abstracting the hydrogen atom and creating new alkyl radicals and new hydroperoxides. Uh, and this auto-oxidation process can be very, very fast, uh, and especially if the temperature is a little bit higher. So we have to normally protect our materials, uh, first against degradation already during processing, but also if we want them to last longer. So the first so-called so primary stabilizer is very often this kind of uh, phenolic antioxidant. And it is a, a very similar antioxidant that we eat, that we <laughs> use to protect ourselves. And uh, the fact is that uh, people have all even tried to use some vitamins as stabilizers in, in polyethylene. The problem is some uh, uh, discoloration of, of the materials, but they are working uh, as well. Um, another thing is that, uh, the, and this antioxidant works as that it donates this hydrogen atom, so this peroxy radical will be uh, converted to a hydroperoxide. Uh, but uh, as I told you, this hydroperoxide is not very stable, so we want also to take this away from the material. And uh, so we have normally also a secondary stabilizer like this phosphite, which will react with hydroperoxide and give stable products that will not damage the polymer chains. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you have heard about biodegradable materials. They are uh, designed in this way that uh, instead of uh, having a, a secondary stabilizer that uh, uh, you take care of those hydroperoxide, uh, it, it, it is possible to add a, a transition metal salt, which will instead catalyze the degradation of the hydroperoxide and make it go even faster. Um, and we can uh, ask ourselves what will be the degradation products. And uh, here in Stockholm, uh, we had a, a group with uh, 
Professor Anne Christine Albertson, that did a lot of work to analyze different degradation products from the oxidation of polyethylene. And you can see they found more than 200 different degradation products uh, of these types. Uh, and uh, you can see here different uh, carboxylic acid and ketones and so on. This degradation product have, of course, different chemical properties than the original polyethylene. They are uh, different hydrophobicity, different uh, 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 also uh, properties uh, that are attracting, for instance, microorganisms. Uh, I will also stress here how important are those degradation processes because polymers are very sensitive to them. And this is also an example. If we have a polyethylene chain with uh, 6,000 monomeric unit, and if we get chain station because one carbon atom in the middle react, then we will get two a polymer chains with half of the molecular weight. But the number of atoms that reacted is 0.008%. So we don't need so many carbon atoms to react to get a tremendous change of uh, uh, properties. And uh, so it is very important to realize that uh, since the properties of polymeric materials derive from the long molecular chain, there is a direct relationship between the size of the molecules and the mechanical properties, then anything that will break those chains have a very significant effect. Both for mechanical properties, the uh, propensity to create microplastics, but also to change completely the chemical nature of this polymer. And here you can see the commercial polymers are in the range uh, polyethylene. Uh, properties depend mainly on molecular weight, but also to some extent of the amount of crystallinity in, in the materials. But you see, if, if, if the molecular weight drops below a certain value, we have no longer polymer, it is not plastic. We have waxes, we have liquids, greases, and so on, but not plastic. Um, I will uh, tell something about degradation of polyethylene from cradle to grave. And I, Probably you have seen a lot of statements of, of this type that it can take centuries for processes to degrade plastics in the ocean. And what does it mean? I, in my opinion, this sentence does not provide any valuable information. In some special cases, Maybe it's true. In most cases, it will not be true. So, uh, it is important to know how it works. And if we want to make a graph of a lifetime of a polyethylene material from cradle to grave, then we start with something that we could call induction time. And this induction time depends, of course, on the polymer, environmental conditions, and additives. And uh, for uh, many packagings uh, and plus, uh, material products that are designed for short life, this induction time will be very, very short. 
especially in, in uh, tropic areas. Uh, and it can range from maybe days to weeks. Uh, when this induction time has passed, it means that normally that the stabilizers that were added to protect the material against degradation are consumed. So there is nothing left to protect the material again against the oxidation. And as I show you in previous slide, once this oxidation process starts, it will only accelerate. So first, it will be a re reduction in molecular weight, which means that it will be a reduction in mechanical strengths and properties. From the beginning, this polyethylene material is very uh, flexible. We, the elongation at break of such material can be several hundred percent. But of course, when we degrade the material and molecular weight uh, decreases, this elongation at break will be less and less. And you can see that we once we come to the point where the molecular weight is about a few thousand, the material will fall apart. So from this material, we will get the material that is just fragmented, disintegrated. Then you can ask, is this plastic or what is it? Because plastic is a material based on polymer. But then once w when we come to this point, we have no polymer. We have degradation products of, uh, of polyethylene with molecular weight of a few thousand and heavily modified by incorporating of oxygen into the molecular structure. So once we are here, the bioassimilation starts. And one thing is very important, because there is a misconception regarding this. Large non-degraded plastic pieces cannot be broken to microplastics by forces exerted by sea waves. And this is something that I know from discussion with other scientists, which are not polymer scientists, uh, there is a belief that waves and some kind of abrasion can create microplastics. It cannot. Not for uh, polyethylene or... Uh, of course, uh, if we have rubber tires which are abraded against the road, we will create microplastics. If we have a pain on the boat and we uh, try to remove it uh, by some wearing, we will create microplastics. But a plastic bag cannot be turned into microplastic only by, by forces from sea waves. It must be degraded by oxidation processes. And I will show you also because there is a worry also about what the degradation products can do to the environment. And uh, of course, it is not a general that I show here. It, is, it applies for polyethylene, because other plastics will create other degradation products that may be harmful. But if we compare uh, to degradation of polylactic acid, PLA, which degrades by hydrolysis. It is an ester, and uh, with water and some heat, it will degrade it to carboxylic acid and alcohol. These are the same products that we get from term, uh, thermoxidative degradation of polyethylene. If we compare with degradation of lignocellulosic materials, 
This is recently published. And you look into the scheme. It is the same as I showed you before for polyethylene. It is a free radical reaction with oxygen creating peroxy radicals and so on. And the degradation products will be very similar. Another thing, I think that there will be next speaker that will talk about uh, uh, microbial degradation, but it is also uh, now that when microorganisms have colonized the surface of oxidized plastic, there are a number of enzymes that will promote the peroxidation process. So we will have the synergistic effects of uh, oxidation, and uh, uh, enzymatic promoted oxidation. And now I would, how much? Okay, uh, I, I will uh, finish by showing a few results from our recent uh, uh, research work. Uh, we performed uh, uh, research uh, that uh, resulted in a paper published last year together with uh, uh, our PhD student Therese Colson and Professor Martin Hasselhoff from the uh, University of Gothenburg. Uh, and we started with assumption that uh, a large part of plastic waste is generated on shore. And this plastic will be there for different periods of time and different temperatures, depending on, uh, on uh, a number of conditions. But sooner or later, this plastic will end up in the marine environment. But during the time of plastic on, on land, the material will degrade by oxidation, but we will for sure have materials with different degrees of, of degradation. So we use one material that will not, uh, that was not degraded. The same material was subjected to a controlled thermoxidative degradation. Uh, and we took a material after the reduction of elongation that break to 46%, and another material that was degraded to elongation outbreak break of 20%, and the third had the elongation of break of 14%. So it shows the degree of uh, uh, degradation or oxidation. And then we use those pre-degraded materials and also this control material. And uh, we constructed this experimental setup that was placed on the floating dock on the west coast of Sweden in this type of cages. And then we periodically removed those materials and make some analysis. And here it is uh, scanning electron micrograph uh, using also X-ray diffraction analysis. And you can see uh, this is after 12 weeks in, in seawater here. And you can see that uh, we have a lot of silica after 12 weeks. And we have also calcium. This is control that is this material is not pre-degraded, but even here you can see some uh, fouling and deposit. You can also see uh, the infrared uh, spectra uh, within the carbonyl region, and you see that uh, the control material has no carbonyl peak because there are no carbonyls in the original material, but the degradation by oxidation creates carbonyl peaks uh, and uh, this uh, third level with uh, elongation on break of 14% uh, uh, 
gives a quite huge carbonyl peak. And then we also analyze uh, uh, the carbonyl index for all four materials as a fun function of exposure time in seawater. And you can see that the material that has not been pre-degraded, original material, you see that the carbonyl index increases during 12 weeks, which is quite interesting because, as you know, the temperature in, in the seawater outside West Coast is not very high, even if it was during summer. But we can still observe that this oxidation is going on in water. But another very interesting thing that I found very exciting is that for the, this level three, the most degraded material, the carbonyl index decreases. And it can only mean one thing, and it is that microorganisms consume those degradation products, because there is no other explanation. And also, we can see here the biofilm coverage, and we see that there is not very big difference between original material and heavily degraded material. The biofilm will be formed there. Okay, let me show only the last picture and it with some main conclusions. So, oh, uh, all polyethylene films continue to oxidize, uh, and after 12 weeks, the more degraded films sank to the bottom. And it is a very important observation because it means that we have to look for microplastics in sediments on the bottom because it is material that is floating from the beginning. The density of the material is lower than waters. And uh, all we could also measure that there is a higher coverage of biofilm uh, on more degraded materials. Uh, and we also observed that all pre-degraded samples started to uh, fragment. It was a spontaneous uh, fragmentation. But what is needed is first the uh, abiotic degradation to come to this point. And this indication of bioassimilation is very interesting, uh, and uh, we will continue with this. And you can see also how nature can take care of different materials in its own way. So uh, there is a person that I would like to thank, and also thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>